Well, um, so much to respond to, and again, I apologize. I'm pressed for time here. I'm really trying to keep up because, I don't know, it seems like a conversation definitely worth having, but we're everybody involved, and there isn't a huge number of us, but we're throwing huge amounts of information into this. And in Mendham, in his previous video, said, okay, um, there's some stuff that you said that I might be glossing over, and it's not intentional. If there's anything you'd like to draw to my attention. Okay, one of the things that I think has become apparent when we're discussing this is you need to be fairly dogged. Um, and if nothing else, in Mendham of I, and, I, and I have proven that we are extremely dogged people. Um, I'm dogged, and I know he is. And you know, again, if you're if you're able to sort of swim against a current of extreme hostility for years and years, uh, like I and he have, you learn how to be dogged. So if something is slipping through the cracks here, um, if arguments aren't going to be addressed, I have no problem repeating myself. Everybody knows this. I, do, I don't mind repeating myself forever. Uh, so, again, there's only so much information you can cram into one video. Um, there's only so much stuff you can respond from the other person's video or their comments or whatever. So, the stuff is going to, you know, disappear and I'm tired. You know, I won't. Um, and, and I won't object to stuff that isn't dealt with because, again, we're kind of condensing our arguments so much and putting so much stuff in there that it's difficult to actually do each other justice. So anyway, just want to make that clear. And if there's other, that goes for everybody that's, that's engaged in this. Um, <clears throat> one of the interesting points that Mystic of the Sands in his interesting comments on mine and Gary's video uh, raised is this, and, and, and Mendham alludes to it as well, this idea of paradox. Now, what do you what do you do when, um, like, Mystic of the Sands says, you understand that? Okay, Andy, you're saying that you're a, a firmer and, and Mendham is a renunciant, but arguably you're both renunciants. Or arguably, in Mendham is I, he didn't say this, but I can see how arguably, in Mendham is the affirmer in a sense, and I'm the renunciant. Now, that seems crazy, but I see what what that means. I see, like, depending on a certain perspective of, of, of analysis of, of each person's point of view, one person is affirming and one person is renouncing, depending, you know, on how you see it. Um, Mystic of the Sand says, okay, you, do you see how um, the quote-unquote denier, again, just colloquial um, use of the term here, just so we, you know, I think we we know now that I'm not trying to mischaracterize anyone by using that label, um, might be actually affirming something. In other words, affirming the value of an existence devoid of suffering, or it, affirming the value of a universe devoid of suffering, or at least with the reduced amount of it. That's an affirmation. You're not, you're, you're giving up something that isn't of great value in order to get something of greater value. That, in a sense, is an affirmation, isn't it? Um, you're saying that there are things out there that are worth more than what I've got now, um, which is, again, almost, I wouldn't say a statement of faith, but a statement of um, a statement of not being infirm of purpose, I guess. A statement of um, this is a stance worth having. Uh, yeah, I get that. I... I see how that could be argued. And, again, I said I'm an affirmer, not a renunciant, but Mystic again says, well, you understand how you could say that you're a renunciant, and yes, I get it. Because if I'm saying love of necessity, then I'm admitting that a vast amount, it's hard to say how much of what I perceive is determined or is necessary. I think necessary makes more sense is produced by necessity. Right now, I'm in this moment of becoming, and again, I just want to reiterate what I mean by necessity. It's just now where I find myself, where I actually can choose, where I can invoke my prohydrasis. I can only choose stuff in the present. I can't choose in the future, and I can't choose in the past. These things are set. So, in, my, in the moment where I actually have the faculty of choice to resort to, 
my choices are very limited because right now I find myself due to the past due to things I did in the past i.e. they are beyond my control I'm now sitting here talking into a webcam I can't change that just like that but I can change certain things I can change the way I look at it apparently I can change that but again you see how this almost but from a certain point of view looks like hard determinism right which is this, the very thing that I'm always objecting to but wait I'm saying that I have the choice though to affirm or deny it but there's only certain things that I can actually control so in a sense I am renouncing my attempts to control or anything um, which goes to you know in Mendham's point well look I, I you know maybe maybe you don't have um, maybe you don't have a great deal of choice over where you are in the moment of becoming and a lot of what you can and can't do is determined. In fact, perhaps in a physical sense, it's all determined, right? Um, because if, if my own past actions are now set and determined and beyond my control, then even my choice to sit here actually has created a determined position for me now in the moment of becoming. Um, <clears throat> now add this, add in this the, the perfectly valid objection that Inmendum raised. The path improves as we go along, or it can improve. Now, th the problem with this is, it's not as easy to an objection to overcome as you might think. And it's one of those things, you have to really toy with it. If, like I always say that all, all that we see around us is matter, energy, and empty space, and all the different configurations are things that we put on it. Uh, identity and non-contradiction and all this kind of thing. Um, but why does it seem like there are actual things out there? Um, if, if, if there's nothing out there but very simple mechanics, and ultimately all the other stuff is just stuff we project onto it, why does it seem so bloody real? Um, <clears throat> to use the old Indian metaphor, why does the rope laying on the road look like a snake when it's not a snake? Um, <clears throat> now, as Mendham did point out, it does look as though we can improve it. Um, for example, if I, you know, um, I used to be a lot heavier than I am now. I chose to go on a reducing diet and get more exercise. I'm now lighter. Okay, I did invoke my pro races for a very long period of time when I had the option of eating or not eating, so I chose to do this, or I had the choice of exercising or not exercising or whatever. All that's now determined, and it's all in part of the past. But it looks as though I actually did invoke my faculty of choice to change myself or to change my own experience of becoming, right? <clears throat> so... To juxtapose against the idea that the universe just is what it is and it's just universe, and you've got this apparently convincing arg amount of evidence that things have changed. But I think another thing that that I would say to that is, um, yes, but we don't really know. Like we can change things, but we can't really know if we're changing things for the better or for the worse. Um, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and that's why when you're sort of dealing with the kinds of um, uh, paths that say, be in the game, not of the game, it's all about the game, but not the, the goal or anything. In fact, the goal actually is probably a negative, but if you're actually playing the game for the sake of playing it, you have to forget about improving or allowing things to deteriorate. The the outcomes really are utterly out, out of your hands. Uh, first of all, we don't even know what the outcomes of our own actions are going to be. And secondly, we have no control over so much of it that you know it's kind of crazy to sort of pin too much hope on working hard towards a goal and achieving it. But the thing is, it does look as though we can actually set goals and achieve them. Um, and and having and 
And how do you how do you meet that objection? Because as I say, I, I, I like to characterize the Jains as kind of the ultimate deniers, but there may be more uh, more denying than that, like the Gnostics or whatever. Um, because the Jains don't go so far as I think to say that phenomenal existence is evil. They sort of say it's just onerous, whereas I think the Gnostics kind of say it's actually evil. Um, that's negative. <coughs> But the Jains actually rely a lot, I think, more on logic than the Gnostics do. So that's why I kind of deal with with them instead. Their 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 arguments are usually pretty darn rational. The Jains. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, even even the Jains posit the idea that if you know if, if you suddenly realize that you're nothing but a puppet on strings, there is a way to get out. There is a path you can follow to reverse the process of a karmic accumulation. Um, and that seems to fly in the face of their idea that nothing matters and that, that everything is futile. So which of these is true? Well, again, you have to invoke uh, Syadvada, the sevenfold theory of, um, of, uh, of predicated... Uh, uh, anyway, I think I've explained it before, where you sort of go, in some ways, um, you can't posit a path through this minefield. In some ways, you can in some ways, it is a minefield uh, that's completely onerous, but uh, that, that, that completely traps you in a way that you simply can't get out, like the quicksand metaphor. The more you struggle, the the um, the deeper you sink into it. But there are there is one path that will lead you out of this, even though you're trapped forever. In a sense, you're not trapped, even as you're trapped. Um, how do you deal with these paradoxes? Um, you know, Gary said reasonably, you go on your back. You know, there, I think there's survival courses for dealing with being in quicksand, how to avoid getting sucked deeper into it. Okay, you go on your back and maybe you'll float. Okay, well, the Jane says, <clears throat> action itself is the problem. Don't act if you can. You know, in, in as much as it is even reasonably possible, don't act. Um, which is why you have the paradox of a philosophy that's 2,500 years old that says you shouldn't have children. <laughs> you know, like, how, how does that work? Well, in as much as your human limitations allow you to renounce everything and give up on all actions, do so. Um, so again, they're saying that the universe is futile, but there is something that you yourself can, you know, in a sort of um, a tough kind of self-improvement, do-it-yourself kind of way, uh, very tough, you can actually, in some sense, extricate yourself from the quicksand. Even if all you're doing, and it's interesting, this is almost exactly the way the Jains describe it, you're just floating on the top. They describe the universe as a human body, and the enlightened just sort of floats up to the top, with kind of this lonely bliss at the top of the cosmic head. It's just a metaphor, of course. But that's kind of, it, you know, the floating metaphor is kind of interesting the way that they do it. You haven't conclusively escaped from it. Well, you have, but even as you're trapped in it, you're still above it. You're still floating on, on top of it. So, again, you, paradox. There's so much paradox in this. And, and that's why you, again, I say that you have to repeat yourself over and over again. And there's so much frustration that can build up in this discussion. Because people will take what you take take what you say uh, at, at face value and say, well, you see how this contradicts what you previous said, previously said. Then you have to dr go back a bit and say, well, yeah, I understand the objection, but... I was saying it in this context before, yada, yada, yada. You know, it, it's, it, it, these are, this is not an easy argument or debate or even discussion to have. Um, <clears throat> now, um, again, he uses some interesting metaphors, like karma can be rich. Yes, I agree. Um, I've benefited enormously from studying Epictetus, from studying Nietzsche, from studying um, you know, even Christian theology and things like this, uh, Buddhist, Jainism, all this kind of thing. I would never have had this stuff, you know, handed to me so easily a hundred years ago. And now it's all because of information technology that this stuff is here at the click of a button. Um, leave aside the fact that the, that, the, um, that the Internet is some sort of wishing well that, you know, will just blindly give you what you want, what you ask for it. Again, it's the metaphor I like is she bole, the, the, the gullible god. It, when you ask him for, for a wish, he just grants it without even thinking what it is that 
you know, what the implications are or whatever, just without reflecting. You ask me for this, here it is. And that's kind of the inf internet for you. It's all just out there. Um, some of it, some of this stuff will destroy you. There's every vice you want to uh, to indulge in is available now at the click of a button, but there's also a lot of gold out there. So what is the ultimate nature of the wishing well? It's hard to say. It has two ultimate natures, or as many ultimate natures as you wish to give it. So yes, I did. I, I, I have enormously benefited from um, from uh, the internet, but you know, a lot of people. I'm sure there are casualties out there. A lot of people become sedentary alcoholics because of the the internet, or a lot of people, I guess, become porn addicts or or gambling addicts or things like this. Now, again, that's just the internet, but the internet is kind of the universe, sort of in microcosm, um, or the human experience in microcosm. Ask and you'll get it. Okay. What are you going to click on when you go online? You know that's that's life. So yeah, we have we have things that are that you know karma can be rich. Yes, it can also be unspeakably horrible and grand, grandiose. Um, it can be any number of things. It doesn't have one nature. Um, and he says the past empowers us. Yes. Now, one of the interesting things that I noticed in um, in my travels is different cultures perceive history in different ways. Um, in North America, we're, you know, Americans basically are all about kind of the future and the present. Not horribly interested in history. Um, Canadians a bit more in the European way, where they're more, they kind of have a greater connection to their past. In other words, we, we kind of see ourselves more as an offshoot of Europe than the Americans do. Therefore, European history is kind of our history, too, whereas I don't think Americans feel that quite so strongly. Uh, you go to Europe, and the past weighs heavier on you because you go everywhere, and there's monuments to when we fought those people just over there, you know. Uh, but you go to a, to a place where it really gets powerful, like in India, and the weight of the past seems to cause you to sag. It's just so heavy, which kind of, you know, would account, in my opinion, for that legendary Indian sense of, I would even say, apathy. The idea, like a lot of people have gone to India and said, these people just don't care about anything. They're just not impressed by anything. Um, I, I think I could go even further and look at the native Canadians who, like, I mean, they're the ones that have lived in a reserve or were born there, and these people are even more apathetic, even I find, than the Indians, or they look more apathetic from the outside. Because it's based upon this, because uh, I think that their past is so much more all-encompassing than ours. Uh, again, I'm just trying to figure it out. But So the past can be rich, but the past can also weigh heavily upon you, in, you know, in the sense of the snowball metaphor. Not all your experiences, not all your, um, not all your accumulation is good. Um, it's the, the majority opinion in, in, in the Eastern way of looking at things, and I would say in the Western way of looking at things, is that your experiences are usually pretty onerous. Sadder and wiser is the usual rule. Um, but again, you can actually benefit from it. I agree. Um, I'm always, like, I'm a history nut, and I'm always talking about the absolute futility of, of um, trying to learn anything from history, and yet I keep trying to learn things from history. So, um, but it's it's true that we can, like, I won't, I won't deny that. It's true that we can actually benefit from the past. Um, but I would also say that when we try to figure out what the past means to us, we have to kind of mischaracterize it in a certain way because there's no one way to look at the past, right? Um, you know, the, the Roy Rogers is famous saying, you know, things sure ain't what they used to be and probably never was. You know, the, that's that's kind of encapsulates my view of the past. I don't know if I have an accurate view of it because um, it keeps changing. I, I tell everybody that I, I deal with uh, occasional bouts of depression and it can get pretty bad, but it, it just goes away of its own accord. But what happens is when you're in the moment of depression, you sort of suddenly believe that you're seeing things as clearly as you possibly can, and you're looking back over a past that you know that when you were living it, you thought it was wonderful, but you're going, okay, I was blind at that point. Now I can see correctly. Now I can see things for what it really was, and I was just a blind idiot in love with this crazy existence that I have that really is meaningless. This 
extreme clarity of this is, I think, what makes depression so intractable. It just seems so unarguable that I'm now seeing things clearly. But then that passes. And then you say, wow, was I ever depressed? You see? And now, so in each state, you're thinking that, like when you're not depressed, you think that being depressed is a pathological state. When you are depressed, you think being not depressed is being a blind or, or naive state, a gullible state. And which is which? And as your perspective shifts, you sort of go, okay, each time that it shifts, you go, now I'm seeing things clearly. It's unclear which, which view is the, is the right one, as it were. Uh, and I would say likewise about the past. What can we learn from this? For example, my, my view of the Holocaust is this is why we must give up on scapegoating, period. Because instead of having Arbeit macht frei written over the doors of Auschwitz, um, we would, we should have insert bad people here or insert disruptive people here. It just so happens that the consensus at that point was, or in some quarters, that it was the Jews who were the square pigs and we just remove these people. But interestingly, when you look at the way that we've reacted to this, it's almost as if we as a civilization has decided, have decided, instead of putting Jews in there, we should have put Nazis in there. Because they're the bad people. We haven't really learned anything. It's just that we just sort of say the wrong people got put in there and gassed. If we'd just taken all the Nazis and put them in there and gassed them, then things would be a lot better. The problem is, I think that's a simplistic view of what actually happened in the 1930s. What did happen to, to create this mess? <laughs> How far back do you want to go? Um... So how do we know um, whether or not we can actually influence the future correctly due to the butterfly effect? And uh, you know, I, I, in Mendham is making you know some good points there, and you know favors backfire. I try to do the right thing, and something horrible happens. I like again the movie The Messenger is all about that. When you honestly want to do what is right, you honestly want to sacrifice yourself to rightness you can still create vast errors and be selfish as hell and not even know it. And you only know it later when you look back at yourself, but how do you know that your vantage point when you're looking back at yourself is the right one? You know, How do you know when you're judging yourself accurately, let alone anyone else, let alone the moment of becoming? How do you know when you're getting an accurate view of things? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> now, again, it's this argument, we're kind of skipping around the point, the, the, or being diplomatic about the fact that we are really pointing fingers at each other, and, but there are ways to do this in a way that you can actually keep the argument going. And yes, I accept a lot of the criticisms. Um, you know, I, I accept the criticisms, but, but again, the thing is, this is an interesting time to put this in, it's just a coincidence. I got a vasectomy uh, last uh, Friday, a week ago tomorrow. Um, okay, now does that now make me an antinatalist? Now does that mean that I've joined the other side? Because the past is determined, I can't undo the fact that I now have a child that I'm responsible for, etc., etc. W- what does this actually mean? Um, it means that, well, maybe now the only thing I can reasonably do is to give my son a life that is worth living or do everything that I can to do it. And Mendham says that I can't actually give him a world worth living in. Correct. I agree. Utterly and totally agree. No parent can do that. No parent ever had that ability to do it. I can teach them how to navigate the world as it is, but I can't really make the world really worth living in, and I think that's one of the fallacies of the age we live in. Well, we want to leave a better world for our children. Okay, what what's a better world? Uh, and how do we know what the results of our attempts to make a better world are going to be? give Stalin and Hitler the benefit of the doubt and say they meant everything, they meant well, okay, um, Hitler might have said, in, in, I understand that this is pretty horrific, but this is the best we can do in the real world. Some people are going to be slaves and some people are going to be masters. Sorry. That was more or less the ancient Greek and Roman view. Whereas, um, you know, Stalin said we're going to build a wonderful future for everybody once we weed the garden. That's really the problem. We've got to weed the garden and then everything is wonderful for everybody. Well, it's all very well if you actually can identify the weeds. 20 million deaths later in the gulag and the execution chambers, and while well, they had created a pretty regimented society, but was it a, was it a utopia? I certainly don't think so. 
So really, how do we know that we can actually improve anything? We can't. I think that all that I can do is teach my son how to navigate it and to um, um, to actually learn to cope with it. I think coping is probably the best way to do it. See, I had a father that never taught me how to cope. I had to learn everything through trial and error. My father was a good father, a nice guy. He provided me with whatever I wanted and everything, but he never really said, this is what you do when when you want to meet a girl, you know, you, this is what you do when you want to make friends, and um, this is how people think, and this is how, you know, when you react to them, and, you know, it, it, you know, this is this is what your sexual awakening meets. I just had this silence my entire life on that stuff. I could have all kinds of small talk and everything with my parents. No, um, no attempts to tell me or help me get through this life thing. Um, now, that they may have done me a favor that way. Other people would say they were neglectful. My father was a neglectful man, for that reason. Other, other, another, um, another view of looking at that is, he said, the world is your oyster. It's for you to decide what you're going to make of it. My job is to make sure you're fed, clothed, and housed, and uh, and make sure that you know your, you know your overt physical needs are met. But the rest is up to you because that's the fun part of life is in discovering everything. I don't think my father would have put it in those words, um, but you know, again, from most people people's perspective, that that's a pretty darn emotionally neglectful way to to deal with it. But he may not have meant it that way. And here I am trying to be a major part of my son's life to try and teach him everything. Whereas, wait a minute, sooner or later he's going to have to do this on his own, and I've got to prepare him for that. So in, in in a sense, my father's way was just as good as the way that I'm planning on raising my son, even though they're polar opposites because we don't know the outcomes and and not only that the outcomes are not static you don't get an outcome and then it just ends there it just keeps outcoming um, so yeah I, I think that there are no guarantees but against against that I put up the idea of the futility of trying to end existence um, like the in brute physical terms it often strikes me that some people believe that you can destroy the universe that you can blank existence out of existence I don't think that that's possible. Or if so, I would call that an ideal of the highest order. Um, uh, ultimately, I think that's where, you know, the puny factor comes in when I talk about, you know, stuff like Benatar and uh, and Sati and everything like that. Uh, and even the Jains, when they're talking about their own prescriptions, they admit their own puniness. It's most most people aren't going to listen to us. We live in a world where our message really is not going to, you know, make much difference at the end of the day. Things are just going to go the way they go. You know, maybe one or two people out of every billion can get out of this mess. So, you know, it's there's, there's no way to improve the world. There's just tough do-it-yourself paths to follow. Um, everybody is trapped. The gods, too, are trapped. They can't help you. Um, the only people that can that, that are worth sort of looking to are the, the genas. They're called the conquerors. The, or the tirthankars, the people who make a way across the river all that they do these blank-eyed uh, genas is they show they they lead by they, they purely set an example they don't offer any help to you whatsoever but again I see that as an ideal and I don't know that I'm comfortable with ideals like that because again if I knew that ultimately I was going to float up to the top of the cosmic skull if I was guaranteed that this was going to happen then I might be pretty darn tempted to lay down and stop eating um, but I don't know um, that's way too much do it there and then not here and now for me that's simply a question of temperament though I, that, that could be it as well I don't um, I, I'm, I'm reconnected with Mystic of the Sands after a few months hiatus and he strikes me as a, as a renunciant of the sort of ending everything or destroying the universe sort of variant. Don't take that the wrong way, Mystic. I, you know, I don't, I don't mean that hostilely. I think you understand the way I'm trying to characterize it. You, you wrote a poem once, Amor Vacui. I'd like to read that again, by the way. And that's kind of how I interpret what you're saying. That's temperament, right? Whereas I'm a bombastic sort of wave your arms around as you talk type person. I seem to my 
my point of view seems to lend itself to action. Um, I don't know if we can actually say one is right or one is wrong, but but it would be interesting to explore the idea. Why did uh, one person? Why does one person go one way and another person goes another? And with the possibility of conceding that maybe they're the same at the end of the day, renunciation and affirmation may end up being two sides of the same coin. I'm okay with that. Um, my view of <clears throat> cosmology implies that the only the only changes that can be made are purely internal, involving the faculty of choice. So, renouncing and not renouncing, or renouncing and affirming, don't kind of rock the boat or, or shift the the way the universe is in any way at all. Um, it's kind of the exact opposite of these teleological proselytizing faiths um, or philosophies. I don't want to convert anybody to my point of view. And in fact, the, the people who share my point of view generally are secretive, very secretive. And I, and, and again, um, an antinatalist might not be secretive about it, but fully expects to get kicked in the face every time he opens his mouth to say what, he's, say what he has to say, or she. Um, so yeah, it's these philosophies are not for, I would say, the vast majority of people. Um, and I think most people sort of oscillate their entire lives between the two. Uh, so, again, it's not, I don't think either of us are really prescribing anything that has any sort of big picture implication. Um, me, because I say that I'm, it's, you're guaranteed to be misunderstood if you engage in what I engage in, and the antinatalist, ethelist, sort of Jane Gnostic, whatever you want to call it, has a point of view that is almost automatically going to get you viewed in a hostile way. So it's not so much that you don't want to propagate your message, it's just that the very way things are means your message is always going to fall on unfertile ground, and that's accepted. And I've heard a lot of antinatalists say as much, in the same way that the Jains nod to the futility of their own argument. The Buddha was confident, it seemed that he was confident that he could spread his message when he said to Mara at the end in his last temptation, some people are going to understand what I would, what I have to say. That was Mara's greatest objection here. Uh, the Buddha's message was so profound and so all-encompassing that most people would simply be blind to it, and he overcame that by saying some people will understand. The Jains say nobody will ever understand. <laughs> um, or at least they won't understand by ha having it told to them. They have to live it. That's something I think that, that both polarities here seem to agree upon. Pressed for time, but I managed to squeeze a lot in.